just in case it's worth saving. What can we learn from the gospel message of Mark? What can a pastor learn about avoiding difficult subjects? Well, here's the deal. We worked on it all week long, studied all of the commentaries, and just as I'm preparing to write, I have this idea. I'm going to go through the house and find that canvas bag that Candy keeps all of her, her spiritual ammunition. <laughs> all of the papers and all of the wonderful things that propel her into her daily ministry. And, and also in that canvas bag is that uh, handmade quilted Bible cover that has in it her favorite version of the Bible. Not that it's an NIV, but it's the student's version of the NIV. And it gives references and, and many things, but here's why I was seeking it. Candy takes notes in, in the, the white borders all around the Gospel, the Epistles, and the Old Testament. And, and she writes little notes of things that are said. But she also writes the date upon which she heard that message preached. In my Bible, as I'm preparing, I read line and I write and I make notes in the columns and I write the date also. But, but when I turn to this passage, the passage that many pastors run from, it was like that Bible I told you that I got in as a child, as a youth, that I kept on my bookshelf and prided myself that the pages were still stuck together. I was keeping it so nice. And there was not a mark around any of this portion. And when I looked in Candy's Bible, hers too was pure as the driven snow. You see, I've never preached on this passage before. I've always sidestepped the, the topic of divorce because in our world and in our society, in our relationships, they're difficult at best. And I know that when I preach to my congregation, no matter how much they love me, there is a strong possibility that someone will leave as they do from the dance floor with my footprints on the top of their feet. Women and children of that society were considered property. Our, our societies are totally different. How do we take the message from Jesus, bring it forward, and still have the impact that Jesus wants us to live by? And so if you come into a society like we have today with faithful disciples that we have today, and you start preaching about relationships broken and dissolved. Well, how do you preach that in today's society? Because you see, that message about divorce and relationships, that was already sailed. Now the second thing that I believe is that Jesus is responding directly to a challenge. He, he's in the presence of the Pharisees. And, and uh, there's a little of Jesus in all of us. I like to think there's a lot of Jesus in all of us, but there's a little of Jesus in all of us. And when we're called to the test, we often then address the moment. The Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus. The Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus. The Pharisees asked Jesus about the law of Moses. Is it right for a man to divorce his wife? They didn't ask the other question, did they? They asked about the man divorcing his wife. Because in their society, women and children were commodities. 
Actually, women were just one step above children because women at least cooked and cleaned and bore children. Children had no title. So on the, the ladder of success in their society, there were two bottom rungs held by children and women. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees? Divorce is wrong, whether it's a man or a woman. Relationships are good. I'm reminded of the time, not only of that get out of free pass that Moses gave the people because they had such hardened hearts. I'm reminded of the time when God was so frustrated with Israel, God even divorced the children that he loved the most. I'm reminded of the woman that the, that the men of the community dragged into the center of where Jesus was and threw her at his feet and said, we caught her in the bed, the adulterous bed. She should be stoned to death. You remember that story? How did it end? It ended with Jesus saying, I see no one accusing you. Go and sin no more. But the unwritten message there is, I also don't see your husband. I also don't see the man that you were with. All he said was, go and sin no more. You and I have talked about sin, and we know that even the littlest sin is, is, is on the same scale as the biggest sin that anyone could commit in this world in the eyes of God. Yeah. There's some things that I would say to you, well, you know, thank goodness for grace. But here's the thank goodness. That we're not God and we don't have to judge. We shouldn't judge. But sin is sin. And Jesus brought grace. And grace brings forgiveness. Today is a wonderful day. It's the first Sunday of the month because, golly, we get to dine with the Lord at the Lord's table. Here's what I hope you're doing as you're walking forward. I hope in reverence and in silence that brain of yours is just going round and round saying, Lord, you know, I tried this week. I wasn't perfect. But I'm coming to your table for forgiveness so that I might find your grace and the reward of that grace becomes eternal life. And then at that moment, when I hand the elements of communion to you, I see Jesus with his arm around your shoulder saying the same as he did to the woman in the center of that town. I love you more than life itself. Yeah. I forgive you. Go and sin no more. Forgiveness and grace all in one statement. The essence here is simply this. Before you think I'm trying once again to avoid preaching on this, ponder this one fact. The laws we live by are created by humans. The courts are set by humans. And from them, divorce has become easy and informal. You see, God is not about the laws. God is about relationships. God is about commitment. God is about communication. And mostly, God is about covenant. Our discussions of relationships must be addressed in the present and in the now and in the hopes for the future. Isn't it foolish for any of us to bear down on things that have happened in the past? One of the things that's really hard, I think, for us to understand is once we cross that bridge, we cross that bridge. Isn't it more important to figure out who we are now and where God is challenging, challenging us to go. 
So it would be foolish for us to address our, our past mistakes. Because aren't they for sure just regrettable experiences when they're not good? So our focus then must really be on the here and now and where that here and now is taking us into the future. But when it comes to relationships, I'm not just talking about, God's not just talking about, Jesus is not talking about just spending time. Jesus is talking about setting sail on an adventure to learn more about those you love. Yeah. Well, first comes commitment. And what I'm speaking of sometimes seems overdone. How many times have you heard the pastor? How many times have you been encouraged? It's really about commitment. Okay, I have to tell you that when I think of commitment, I'm hearing in the background a song of my teens and early 20s. And I'm not going to sing it, but let me share just a couple of verses and I think you might know the song. The title is 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. <laughs> just slip out the back, Jack. Make a new plan, Stan. You don't need to be coy, Roy. Hop on the bus, Gus. Just drop off the key, Lee, and set yourself free. That's not God speaking, that's Paul Simon. That's words of a, of a society that's much different in many ways and the same in others. Jesus was responding to a test from the Pharisees. A, a test to trap him, to get him in trouble. I don't believe that Jesus responded to the test of the Pharisees the same as if one of us came on bended knee in our prayer closet at the altar with relationship troubles. I think Jesus would talk to our hearts about commitment. Jesus would talk about the second thing that's a problem too. The number one reason for unreconcilable relationships in our world today is communication. That when I counsel people for marriage, I talk to them a lot about communication. I talk to them about how you can get into the mode of, of two ships passing in the night. Where you're worried more about the things you do than the people you love. We're becoming a society that has virtually non-existent relationships and we're in them. Communication is probably the, the number one factor in the breakdown of our marriages, in our relationships, in the loves of our life, in the way that we live. I'm reminded of a situation where it was at the time when CB radios were popular. I think it's probably about the same time as that song, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. That CB radios were the thing. And the husband comes in from the, from the store after a long, hard day of work, and he has this box in his hand, and he goes directly into the living room. And he opens up the box, and he's setting up this CB radio base station. And his wife has prepared dinner, and she's ready to join with him in a relationship. And he's setting up this base station in the living room. Not to be distracted, he finally gets it set up, and he's so excited, and the antenna's all, all up in the air, and he pulls out that microphone, and he starts to call out to the world. And he continues to call out to the world. And he changes stations and he calls out to the world and he calls out to the world and he calls out to the world and gets no response. After about 30 minutes, his wife looks at him and said, if you're so desperate to talk to somebody, why don't you quit fooling around with that thing and talk to me? We need commitment fortified by communication to strengthen our relationships. Commitment. Communication. Have you ever been at a 
a wedding celebration, a reception, uh, especially one that, that uh, the couple has been married like 50 years. And there's always someone who goes to the husband and says, you know, you are an example for all of us. But the question that I have for you, in these 50 years, have you ever considered divorce? And the man looked back and he said, no, not once. Murder several times, but not <laughs> divorce. What we need is this covenant. A covenant not between just a husband and a wife, not between the relationship of the two, but we need a Trinitarian covenant. <coughs> the two in relationship plus God. A Trinitarian covenant. Statistics tell us that when two people are in love, I mean like really in love, <laughs> and they get married, they only have a 50% chance of survival. Statistics tell us that when you have two people in love who believe in Christ, they only have a 50% chance of surviving in that relationship. Statistics tell us that when you have two people in love who love Jesus and come to church on Christmas and Easter, they have a 50% chance of staying in that relationship. I have to leave you with one good statistic though. Statistics tell us that two people in love, who love Jesus, who come to church on Christmas and Easter and spend 75% of the rest of that year in church in a relationship with God have only a 2% chance of breaking that relationship. Relationships take all three. Commitment, <laughs> communication, and covenant. Commit yourself. Communicate with each other. Keep God part of this covenant. You all know that I have this extensive library and I have multiple versions of commentaries on every book of the Bible, every passage in the Bible. That's the one I use most. Dr. David Garland authors the book of Mark. Quickly, I turned to this and I found that I have preached on Mark so many times that the binding is broken and the pages are just stuffed into the outside until I get to the 10th chapter of Mark and there's nothing written there and it's just that it red lines and notes in the margin and then all of a sudden it's like this part stuck together because I have never written anything in there until now. And Dr. Dr. Um, Garland really broke it down for me and helped me to understand that if God is with us in commitment and communication and covenant, we don't need fear the breakdown of our relationships. Here's the story that he told me that kind of made sense to me, kind of made it seem like it was meant for us. Uh, they've been married a long time, Dr. Garland and his wife. And she decided after all these years that she wanted to tackle a new project that she'd never done before. She wanted to create a quilt to represent the events and experiences of their marriage relationship. And then she wanted to put this on the wall in her kitchen because they lived in their kitchen. I mean, everything evolved around the kitchen. Their life experiences were happening and discussed in the kitchen. And, and she decided to pick out all the, the colors and everything that would make this quilt just fit perfectly in the kitchen. Now she never quilted before. She'd done some sewing, but she'd never quilted before. And she says, I know how to do this. I, I can figure this out. So she sat down with the, uh, the colored pencils from her teenage kids. And she sketched out this pattern of what she wanted it to look like. 
And then she started buying material that would match the, the, the pattern that she had uh, drawn out on the, on the sheets. And then the next step, she started cutting out materials that she had purchased. And, and the next thing she realized was, this is not really as easy as I thought it was going to be. And the, the, the pieces that she put in her pattern didn't exactly match up. No, no worry, we'll just cut out a few more pieces and stick them in so that it, it kind of matches. And it wasn't long before she realized that what she was creating really didn't have any similarity at all to what she planned. But she continued, and as the, as the squares that she sewed together then didn't match, she would cut out another piece and sew it in. And when she finished, it was eight months later, and she was really finished. I mean, like, I'm done with this. <laughs> so she and her husband, in that wonderful time they had together, uh, bought a hanger, and they placed it in, in their kitchen on the wall, but it wouldn't lay flat and because one side was longer than the other and the other side was shorter and twisted down from the wall and add more pieces to it and continue. Finally, they put it up and, and they realized. They realized that their marriage quilt was really like their marriage. In the end, it has to be finished so that it will hang straight. More and more, the quilt resembled their lives together. It resembled the commitment, the communication, and the covenant. And that was their marriage relationship, no matter how many pieces needed to be added, or subtracted, or the mistakes that happened along the way. Because when they finished the quilt, even well, you know, the good part is nobody would mistake that for a store-bought. <laughs> it was an image of their marriage. But isn't that true? In the beginning of every meaningful relationship, we sketch our plans for the future. But we always underestimate the work that it's going to take to complete that, that quilt. Of taking two lives and quilting them into one. The thing that we don't add in that wonderful drawing, that wonderful sketch in the beginning, is the mistakes and the hurts that go along the way. And we get discouraged when the pieces don't look like they fit into what we planned in the beginning. But the whole journey is what makes that quilt strong and unique, isn't it? In the end, the quilt is an exact representation of the life that you have shared together. The pattern is so much larger than you wrote in the, and drew in the sketch because God has a plan much bigger than you can ever understand for your life. But our relationships and our quilts of our lives are based on three things and that's commitment, communication, and covenant. And that's what God intends for all of the faithful, all of the disciples, to have strong, lasting relationships built and nourished around love. I came from a generation that taught their children to spell phonetically. So if you spell love phonetically, isn't it like C, C, C? Commitment, communication, and covenant? And all the children say. Amen. Amen.